Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. It's Monday, February 26, 2018, the regular meeting of the Glendale Transportation and Parking Commission. Uh, what is the first item on the agenda? Item 1A is roll call. Commissioner Gonzalez? Here. Commissioner Kirkjian? Here. Commissioner Sahakian? Here. Commissioner Makarian? Chairperson Yakubian? Here. Next item. Item 1B is flag salute by Chairperson Yakubian. Thank you. Please join me standing to honor our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You, okay, what's next? Item two is posting of the agenda. The agenda for the Monday, February 26, 2018 special meeting of the Glendale Transportation and Parking Commission was posted by Friday, February 23rd, 2018 before 5 p.m. on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. Great, next item. Next item is approval of minutes uh, for June 19, 2017 special meeting, October 30th, 2017 special meeting, December 11th, 2017, special meeting. January 24th, 2018, special meeting. Okay, let's take these one at a, a time. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the June 19th, 2017, special meeting. Move to approve. Second. Okay, we have the next. Next one is uh, 3B, October 30th, 2017. Madam Chair, I abstain on the next three because I was absent. Certainly. I move approval of October 30th, 2017, please. Seconded. Next, 3C, uh, December 11th, 2017. I move approval of December 11th, 2017. Seconded. Lastly, 3D, January 24, 2018, special meeting. Move approval also January 24, 2018. Second. Next item. Item four is oral communication. Discussion is limited to items not part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision. Okay, I don't have any speaker cards tonight. Um, so I would like to insert at this point, uh, we do have an update um, from city staff on the pedestrian plan. I'd like to move this item, uh, just sneak that portion up before action item uh, number five. So may I call Mr. Zovren up? Thank you. The detail, a detailed uh, presentation was made to you on September 20, 2017. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the detail of the plan. I just want to update you what happened since then. Okay, on the schedule, the adoption of plan, the critical part to the uh, Adoption of plan is the environmental clearance, which we have to go through to be able to adopt it. Fortunately, uh, pedestrian plan, all of the project included in the South Glendale community plan. So when the EIR for South Glendale Com community plan be certified, we are ready to go to council and you know, adopt the plan, the pedestrian plan. And South Glendale Community Plan EIR is going to be certified in mid June 2018. So, after June 2018, we would be able to go to council and submit a plan for an adoption. Okay, other activity that we've been taking since then, since uh, September 2017, is we assembled a team of the projects uh, of the staff 
to go and you know, evaluate a project that is included in PET plan. Mm -hmm. in all of the staff, you know, including civil engineer, traffic engineer, and planner, we went out for three days and looked at to find out the constructability and also traffic impact of a PET plan projects. So the result of that, uh, that field check uh, indicate that you know, we might need you know, additional further traffic study to be able to you know, uh, implement those projects. Larry Tay is here, and he was with us during, his, during the, all of those field checks, and he can talk about the detail of, of traffic study we might need to do later on. The other item we have been very active on is we extended our outreach to the in, in your stakeholder and communities. The reason for it was that we needed to take advantage of this time that we have and talk to the community and, and also stakeholders to receive their support for the plan and also um, a strong community, community support prepare us to have a better funding application to, to implement the plan. In addition to that, we have presented the plan to several community you know, entity, which included what about Glendale, Glendale Healthier Community Coalition, Glendale Chamber of Commerce, and we are planning to do some presentation in March on, on Martin Montel Shopping Center, Glendale Homeowner Coordinating Council, and also Brown Boulevard of Cars, uh, Glendale Kiwanis Club, and Glendale Healthier Community Coalition General Meeting. We are very robust on, on online presents. We are on the website on, on Glendale City, on Planning Division, Public Work Division, and, and also Urban Design and Mobility Division. We have two ongoing survey online, which is going on, on on my Glendale City News and also B Street Smart Glendale.com. That means our community member can go online. And, and comment on the plan and also uh, take a very brief survey with, with look at it and find out what's going on. On uh, other thing that we reach out is we send 2,500 2, emails to all subscribers of, of CDD newsletter. So we take advantage of all of the media and social media to reach out and, and, and talk to the community and get their, their comment as much as we can. And uh, that's the status of, of the PET plan as, as it is now, and uh, we are hoping to be able to go to council probably in July, you know, and, and receive their comment and and also adaptation of the plan. With that, if you have any questions, and if you need further, you know, if you'd like to, <laughs> to receive the detail of all plan, uh, we will we'll be happy to come back to you and present it to you again. Uh, Mr. Silveran, I wanted to ask if, I know that at some point, and as you know, I was on the commission subcommittee with you yes, uh, for that plan. Um, Whatever came of the idea of having um, assistance from the police to get uh, some of this information disseminated among the community, uh, 2,500 subscribers is um, may sound hefty, but you know, in a city as large as ours, um, that's not the kind of outreach that I would I was ho I would hope for, right? To get to get all the good work that that the city is doing, so mm -hmm. people can can hear about it. Um, I do know that there's ways that the the police, uh, who were an integral part of this uh, subcommittee as well, um, are able to reach the public, um, whether they uh, use their spokesperson 
uh, Tawny Lightfoot to disseminate information through Nextdoor or not. But has, has anything been done with that? Yes, we are working very extensively with police and actually with some of the, the school that we rather have a, in Armenian language or, or whatever, one of the PD members, we invite them and go and talk about the safety plan and also pet plan as well. Right. And uh, the media that we are using is very, uh, I mean, using any sources that possible is in, in the can wish to. Right. But that's a good idea. We, I'm gonna go back and talk to them again. And, um, and also, as you know, this plan is going in conjunction with the safety plan and also, you know, safe laughter in the school. Of course, yeah. So we're doing all three at the same time, and we're working in the school district and we can take it to PD and, but PD, were, uh, as you know, you, you, you were part of the major part of the plan, you know. PD we, we very much active in, in this plan and also implementation right. is. Right now we, we're working on how we can go ahead with the project that included, in, in, you know, in pedestrian plan and how we can, you know, move those projects. Right. Madam Chair, so, so what I'm hearing, what, what you said tonight is that uh, there's, a, there's an outreach, public outreach, trying to uh, reach out to our community to get their buy-off on the plan. And this is being done via social media, via email, blasts, and, and, and mailers, correct? And, and presentation to the... And presentations. Yeah. What I'd stakeholder. like to do, I'd like to bring staff back for a presentation of the plan to the committee, if, if, if you guys agree, uh, a detailed presentation. Uh, as much as uh, I'd love to say I have the time to read all this, I'll be lying to you if I do that. So I'd like to have a, a, a summary of uh, what, what transpired uh, uh, during these community meetings we've had and, and uh, uh, a discussion of, of, of the findings in the report. Sure. The, uh, the report has the you know, executive summary as part of it, but you understand you want to know what community talking about this plan. That's, Absolutely. That's, yes. that's, that's, that's completely the time and we bring it back to you. Thank you. Questions, please. Um, <clears throat> please remind me because I forgot. Was there a consultant um, commission for this work? Yes. And what is her Wilson or his, uh, uh, was our consultant that we rendered, and also uh, Jennifer, you know, Winland was our our uh, a person from this con consultant. And were there some um, proposed um, enhancements to ensure the success of the pedestrian plan r relative to those? potential needs of improvements and costs? Yes, we went back and, and we looked at all of the projects that we did and we did walk through, we field check and find out what is, is it, what is the constructability of those projects and also what traffic impact we have to do. So, so do you recall an order of magnitude of what the uh, improvements might be estimated to cost? Um, we have it, but at this time, I don't have it in me. I apologize for, for so that. This and also the cost, I'm giving you one example. When we went to the field and we, we talked about one improvement and then we see the cash basin has to be removed. That costs about $100,000 more. So it's really dynamic to talk about it, but you know, there is estimate in the plan. So when um, you come back, uh, if uh, all commissioners want that to happen, um, there will be an outline of the proposed estimated costs? Absolutely. And would there be a, um, a plan on how that would, where the money would come from for that? Yes, that's another thing. The funding portion of the plan is very extensive, and we plan it how we want to fund them. You know, there is some mechanism in, in a plan to follow up and, and get the funding for it. But uh, as you know, we have to know, like 
you know, there is a funding is going on at the step now and at the federal and also state, and uh, they call it ATP, okay, active transportation plan. And uh, our, our pet plan is pretty much, you know, eligible for those, those funding that we have. But we have to do the traffic study to be able to do those plans. We cannot go and get the grant and then come back and say, oops, we cannot do this project. That's the reason that the team of the, um, you know, Edward team and also our, our traffic engineer and us went to the field and check all of the project. And most of them that are ready to go and uh, to make sure that they are really constructible and doable. Yeah, I think the work that had been done from this as was reported here, I think once or twice and especially by our chair because her engagement um, is really something that very few cities, I think, do. Most of the time, there are engineering studies on how to make traffic flow better, how, you know, things like that that are more geared to um, the automobile as opposed to the pedestrian. So I, I think it's wonderful that this has occurred. Um, why do we have to wait till July to take it to the city council? Because sometimes momentum yeah. is lost given the work. This was done in 2017 <coughs> or 16, I don't recall now. We oh. just we just finished uh, the complete draft, you know, about a few months ago. The reason that we're doing that because EIR of the pit plan is 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 you know analyzed as part of the South Glendale community plan. So we are not going to go and do the EIR because if you do the EIR for the pit plan, it's going to take several months to do that. So so, so we played it smart and said okay. Oh. South Carolina Community Plan is going to analyze this project as well too. So as long as we if we go to council and, and also mm -hmm. certify that you know, EIR will be okay to to adopt. So you're coupling the EIR aspect of the South Carolina Plan. Included, yeah, included. But this is a citywide plan, right? Yes. And, so and how that, does that nexus work? Will okay, that the nexus. In the <laughs> that's a very good question, actually. On north part of the Glendale, we're gonna we're gonna look at it and what amendment we can do to that EIR to include it in North Glendale, and the mechanism is there. But you know, I'm not our, our you know environmental planner or planning guy. I'm I'm kind of surprised, but I'm really maybe off on this. Why there would be an environmental impact report for a pedestrian plan? Any plan that you have, you have to go through that. This is not a matter of density engagement, and this is not a matter of issues that have to do with sustainability necessarily. I don't understand why one has to do an EIR for a pedestrian plan. But it's in plan, I usually is end up with a certification of not having any impact. But since removing some of the, changing some of the configuration of, of you know. Intersections? Intersection. Intersection. That change the capacity. When they change the capacity, we obligate to do the EIR. I think my comments are only based on, and I appreciate all the work that's been done. Is sometimes when we do something like this, the momentum is key, and people sometimes either lose interest or not engaged, and all of a sudden it sits. I don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm just saying sometimes, for some reason, that seems to happen under practicality. Mm -hmm. And I just want to caution that hopefully staff and others that are responsible for this take the leadership to move something as important as this and and make it more efficiently and not wait until July. I see why you're coupling it with the South Glendale, but I really question that when this is a citywide initiative that is so important to do and why it wouldn't just move on its own schedule and get done. Mm -hmm. That's good comment, yeah. And, and I, Really appreciate your, your comment, but uh, um, since South Carolina Community Plan EIR is not going to be certified till about May, end of May, so uh, we have to include the North Carolina portion to that to that EIR, mm -hmm. and uh, so we think maybe we can move it to June, but that would be the, the earliest that we can go. But uh, we are actively participating in community meeting. We don't want this die. This this plan is is the one of the best in, 
in, in California. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank all of the you know, advisory mm -hmm. member and Maro mm -hmm. and Sakubian that was a big part of the project and, and we appreciate it very much. So my uh, is is my passion. You know. Thank you. That's that's the same. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the uh, report. I guess Commissioner Gonzalez covered pretty much most of everything I want to say. The only thing, can we get a, like a summary or a plan of action of the report? Because next week we have a meeting for, uh, together with uh, planning, yeah. discussing South Glendale. If we can see some of that the report or, part, or the summary of the report, at least we can have a cohesive thinking going into next week. Uh, is it possible for us to have a summary of the report? Sure. Between now and of then, course. for us to work, to yeah. have a uh, chance to review that. I assume the South Lindell Company plan is pretty hefty and, and you know, big yes. project. <laughs> but, you know, since some uh, common things between the PET plan and South Lindell Company plan, we definitely can address that at the same time. And I provide you a brief of the project, you know, uh, you know some summary of it. Okay. Or, or you know, at least the, in the list of the projects. Okay. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much, uh, Fred, for coming. Um, one last question I have is: Is the educational part of it um, continuing? I know that we had banners circulating on the flag on the streetlights. Um, I think they're rotating through different sections of the city at this mm -hmm. point. Am I right to uh, to say that? And then, and then mm -hmm. on a side note, I'd love to see evidence of this plan still here in the courtyard in City Hall. I mean, uh, it's a, you know, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez is said uh, very humbly that not many cities do something like this. It is um, an extraordinary effort uh, to have seen it firsthand. I can attest that the cohesiveness of all of these different departments and community members was it was a, a sight to behold and, and not typically seen in community engagements. Uh, this was quite an extraordinary effort. I would love to see a permanent banner, at least, uh, you know, as people are walking through City Hall and the courtyards, that we are still, you know, B Street Smart Glendale, and that we're still behind it and keep the momentum going, as uh, as Commissioner Gonzalez said. I know that's. You know, something I can bring up to someone else as well, Fred, but um, I wanted to, you know, let's, to let's tell you all that work and effort having gone into it, um, you know, I don't want to see it slow down and, and it needs to be in the forefront of everyone's mind. On our city's website right. mm -hmm. also would be good, right? Yeah. Or continually showing on the website. The yeah, it's on the site and also for uh, at this time, uh, we are working with Public Works and, and, and Edward, but the decal on the street sidewalk this week, mm -hmm. talking about be smart, of course. That's pretty, really good. And we're gonna do on the 47 you know, intersections that anybody walk can yes. see that. That's gonna be very, pretty good. Yeah. And uh, also the banner is, is in there still, we can use them anytime we, we want and, and we decide what the street we is next. So, you know. thank you so much for your You're welcome. personal note. Thank you so much. I think you're not, you don't come too often to our, our meetings, but uh, you truly were the, uh, the heart, the soul behind uh, what was going on with this PED plan, um, Fred. So, personal note, thank you so much for coming and updating us tonight. You, your leadership and participation has been always, you know, our, our you know, power to go. Okay. So you've been very helpful to me. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for getting it up as an information yeah. item. That's great to hear. Okay, so let's uh, get back on, um, on schedule here. What is the next item? Item five is action item, report regarding revision to City of Glendale Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program. Item 5A is motion approving recommendation to City Council to approve proposed changes to City of Glendale Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program. And Chairperson Jacobian, the, we have two traffic engineers with us tonight, Larry Tay, as well as Pastor uh, Casanova. 
uh, Larry will be presenting the staff report, and after that, we'll be open for any questions that you may have for you and the commissioners. There's also a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, good evening, Chair Jacoby and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Larry Tay. I'm a, uh, I'm a new principal of traffic engineer here with the city of Glendale. Um, uh, for your collective consideration this evening, um, it's the uh, long-awaited proposed revisions to the uh, city of Glendale neighborhood traffic calming program. Um, staff has worked diligently over the last, uh, the last few months uh, to uh, tailor a program that really meets the city's current needs. Uh, takes into consideration a lot of the public input that we've received uh, from the stakeholders, um, and also uh, one that maintains overall program integrity and really serves, uh, main, uh, continues to serve the purpose of the traffic calming program. Um, with that in mind, and before really discussing the, the proposed changes uh, that, that staff would like to bring to you, I, I'd kind of like to offer a little bit of perspective. Uh, with, with that in mind, this uh, presentation tonight will touch upon uh, some of these following goals that you see here. Uh, one, definitions. There's a lot of terms in traffic engineering uh, that we've heard in the past and that we're going to hear over and over again. I think there's some value in kind of just getting from reacquainted with those terms so that we're all on the same page. Uh, kind of history and objectives, uh, kind of where we, uh, how we got to where we are, and, and what, what the program really strives to achieve. Uh, key traffic calming tools. Um, I know the speed hump is, is, is a very formidable tool in our toolbox that needs no introduction, but uh, there are other tools uh, that are equally as, as, as effective, and I, I, I'd like to uh, kind of highlight some of those. Um, and the eligibility criteria, not just for speed humps, but for the overall traffic calming program uh, that, that, that we have. And, uh, and obviously a discussion of pros and cons of speed humps. Speed humps can be your can be a friend. Uh, sometimes they are not so friendly. I think it's important to understand both the advantages and disadvantages. And after all that, we'll get to the proposed changes, I promise. Um, so on to the vocabulary lesson. Uh, one of the things that we'll hear often is uh, percentile speed. Um, uh, just a few examples, the nth percentile speed, really it's, it's defined as the speed at which uh, that specified percentage of uh, vehicular traffic is traveling at or below. So we often talk about the 85th percentile speed. Uh, that really is a speed at which 85% of the traffic travels at or below, or similarly or conversely, 15% uh, of that traffic would be tr traveling above the 85th percentile. And if we talk about the 90th percentile, that's a speed at which 90% of the traffic is at or below, and then only 10% is actually above that. So uh, key terms to keep in mind, ADT, just an acronym for average daily traffic, uh, school and park zone, for the purposes of this report, uh, we, we are going to differentiate between uh, school and park zones and non-school and park zones. And so really, uh, our definition really is uh, and any street that, that abuts uh, one of those uh, land uses. Um, and the last thing, just want to talk about local versus residential streets. Um, oftentimes, uh, people uh, mistakenly presume those are the same. They're, they're one and the same. They really are not. Uh, residential street really talks to the street's land use. Uh, Local um, is, 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 is more the streets, uh, the, where it is in, in, in the overall network, the significance that, that the street plays in the, over, you know, uh, in, in the city's overall and the, the overall regional transportation system. And so you can have a residential street that is non-local, and I think that's also important to, to keep that in mind. Um, so moving on, uh, the purpose and goals of our neighborhood traffic calming program in general really are those, those four items listed above. Uh, really to improve quality of life on, on local streets and residential neighborhoods, uh, reduce speeding, cut through traffic and accidents, and uh, balance the needs of traffic calming, mobility, and emergency response. There's a lot of competing interests, and it's very important uh, to, to keep all of the interests in mind uh, and, and, and not move too far um, you know, in favor of one versus the other. Uh, target streets that demonstrate a significant need, and uh, to this regard, uh, Really, there, there's, there's uh, a difference between systemic speeding and just random speeding. And so systemic, when you have a systemic speeding concern, uh, you, you've got a high volume of, of cars on a particular street that either exceed the posted speed limit or drive at a high rate of speed. Uh, it's, it's something that uh, uh, the majority of vehicles are behaving in this way, and there's, an, it, there's something inherent to that roadway that facilitates that behavior. Random speeding is kind of like the bad apple, the one bad apple. Uh, it, it's a little bit... Uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's a little bit more difficult uh, to, to, for traffic calming to combat random speeding. Uh, it, it, 
take, take for example, um, yeah, just a, a person with a, with, a, with a high performance SUV who wants to drive down a street with speed humps. Um, no matter how high you make those speed humps and no matter how many speed humps you put in, there's not really much you can deter, do to deter that particular person from, from uh, uh, who's intent on violating the speed limit. And uh, so if, 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 if we cater to, to and, 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 and tailor our program to address th that random speeder, uh, you may end up with uh, tra uh, traffic calming features all over, the, uh, really on, on, on every single street and, and this over proliferation of traffic calming devices. So uh, again, systemic speeding, uh, very, very, uh, very good candidate streets for traffic calming, random speeding, uh, not so good as candidate streets. Um, a little more purpose in history. In 1996, uh, our, our city council adopted the uh, City of Glendale Neighborhood Traffic Calming Program. Uh, some of the goals I stated before, but I'll state them again. Reduce accident patterns, discourage non-local cut through traffic, reduce traffic speeds on residential streets, uh, in, important, ensure citizen participation and minimize impacts to emergency response and transit vehicles. When the program was initially conceived, uh, we required a, a, a petition um, uh, that demonstrated 60% of the support from, from the affected neighborhood just to initiate a traffic study and, and to, to confirm that there was in fact a, pr a problem. 75% um, uh, of the, and, and in addition to that, uh, b b before a traffic calming project was implemented, 75% of the neighborhood would have to uh, sign the petition and, and, and provide their consensus. And at the time uh, of our original traffic calming program, uh, the program really, uh, what was available to streets that carried between 1,500 and 5,000 vehicles per day. All right, so in 2004, the council uh, approved some updates to the neighborhood traffic calming program, which uh, expanded the program and allowed for a little bit more flexibility. Um, we eliminated the, the uh, initial petition requirement. So now all it takes is a phone call to our office and, and we will e evaluate it and we will investigate it. No need for that 60% petition just to kick off the process. Uh, we maintain the 75% community consensus. Um, that's an important hallmark of, of the neighborhood traffic calming plan. Uh, we we, we want to make sure that there is uh, uh, overwhelming consensus and support for whatever it is that we're proposing. Um, one of the significant changes that occurred in 2004 uh, was uh, we, 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 we reduced the lower boundary of the volume requirement and then raised the upper boundary of what's, what's allowable. So instead of having a volume range of 1,500 to 5,000 vehicles per day, uh, we're now looking at traffic calming on streets uh, that carry between 1,000 and 10,000 vehicles per day. So again, the program has expanded since in its initial conception. And we also added a clause allowing um, the, 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 the volume criterion to be waived if the 85th percentile speed exceeds 35 miles per hour. So basically, uh, if we do a traffic survey on a particular street, the 85th percentile speed comes back at 35 miles per hour or greater. It doesn't matter how many or how few cars or, uh, that street carries, it is eligible for traffic calming and also speed humps. Um, so we have this program, well, what does it consist of? And I, we kind of talked about speed humps a little bit, uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, bring up the three E's, uh, education, engineering, and enforcement. Uh, really, neighborhood traffic calming is a partnership between our police department, public works engineering, and also members of the community. Um, as far as tools, uh, there are some tools that, uh, that we typically rely on. Um, obviously, to police enforcement, uh, it's a very effective way to, to, to modify driver behavior and to condition drivers. I know it's not self-enforcing and it relies on the presence of police, but uh, it's, it's a very valuable tool in our toolbox. Uh, we have edge lines. They're really just four-inch shoulder stripes on the roadway. Uh, they, they kind of uh, narrow the perceived width of the roadway and in doing so, uh, reduce uh, travel speeds uh, uh, to a certain extent. Uh, radar feedback signs, occasionally we lose track of how fast we're going. These feedback signs uh, are a constant reminder of um, uh, that, that we may need to occasionally slow down. So we have a, a fleet of, ra of feedback signs that we uh, rotate throughout the city and that we've deployed on that rotational basis. Uh, there are also curb extensions, uh, reducing pedestrian crossings, um, uh, tightening up the intersection radii to, to, to reduce uh, vehicle speeds traveling through intersections. We have traffic circles that require cars to kind of circumvent. Uh, that all contributes to reduce speeds also. And diverters, uh, you, you don't see these as often as some of the other tools simply because they have wider spread uh, impacts to overall circulation. Uh, they change traffic patterns. So 
um, it, a lot more people are impacted, or a lot, and, um, but, but the diverters do uh, restrict and prohibit certain movements into or out of uh, residential neighborhoods. And of course, uh, the last uh, tool in the toolbox needs no introduction, it's, it's the speed hump. Uh, it's, it's widely recognized and one that's frequently requested. And here are just some examples of, of edge lines on the upper left-hand corner um, and also the lower left-hand corner that, that we've recently implemented and some of the radar feedback signs uh, on the right side. Um, and uh, on the left si left-hand side, we have just a picture of a speed hump installation and on the right side, a uh, picture of a traffic circle, again, just for perspective. So, how do, we determine whether, how do we determine whether or not streets are, are eligible for, for, for traffic calming? Well, there's a list of criteria um, uh, that, that, uh, that we employ, and these are the basic criteria uh, for any traffic calming request, not just speed humps, but the 85th percentile speed has to be 30 miles an hour or greater. Uh, the average daily traffic volume has to be between one or 10,000 cars per day, and the posted speed limit um, is required to be uh, 25 miles per hour. Again, all of this consistent with local residential neighborhoods. Um, I'd like to point out, and this is very important, again, uh, just to repeat myself, uh, there is no minimum volume requirement if the 85th percentile speed exceeds 35 miles per hour, and as of yet, uh, we don't currently have provisions, uh, special provisions uh, for modified criteria around schools and parks, but we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, so those were the traffic calming criteria. Um, for speed humps, all of those criteria would apply, and in addition, there's a few more criteria that need to be met. Um, you can see them up here. I'll go through them really quick. Uh, it can't be on a primary er emergency response route. We don't want to compromise police or fire response times. Can't be on a transit route. Uh, has to be on a street that's no more than 40 feet wide and one lane for each in each direction. Um, we, we stay away from implementing, installing humps on, on streets that have a steep slope. Uh, that's for kind of s safety purposes. Uh, curbs are required so that cars don't drive around the humps. Uh, obviously, it's got to be in a residential district. Um, the minimum block length is 500 feet. If we get blocks that are shorter, it's, it's hard to install speed humps in a meaningful manner on, if the blocks are too short. Um, and uh, classification, again, just reserved for local and minor collector streets. Uh, streets that are not uh, real, uh, heavily utilized by emergency response teams. And obviously, petition will be required to 75% approval. Um, that said, uh, over the years, and particularly recently, uh, many of our stakeholders um, have encouraged staff, including the commission, have encouraged staff to take a closer look at some of these criteria and to kind of reevaluate and reassess and look for opportunities to make uh, positive changes uh, where, where, where possible. And uh, not necessarily to re-examine all the criteria, but a few key implementation criteria, and those are minimum speed, minimum traffic volume, uh, community consensus support, percentage and also uh, uh, considering special provisions around schools and parks. So that's exactly what we've done. And in October 2017, um, uh, staff performed a comparative analysis of, of, of uh, our speed hump criteria with the criteria of those of other cities of similar size. And, 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 and uh, what, what we found, um, well, first let me just talk about the cities that we compare ourselves against. Um, these are the 12 cities, uh, Anaheim, Burbank, Long Beach, LA, Pasadena, Paso Robles. So again, we've got some from the Bay Area all the, all the way down to San Diego and uh, uh, 12 cities that are uh, representative of, of uh, our, 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 our community, at least from a transportation standpoint. And uh, my colleague, Pastor Casanova, recently pre uh, presented um, the results of that analysis, a comparative analysis, a summary of which you see on the screen right now. And I think the key takeaway, I'm not going to go over this in much detail because you already heard it in October, but the key takeaway is uh, if you look at Glendale's um, <clears throat> uh, criteria, it's a third line in red, and compare it to the bottom line, which is the, the 12 city average. Our criteria uh, are, are very similar and really no more stringent than those of other cities. Um, for example, a speed limit of 25 miles per hour. Um, if, you, if you go down to the average, we see 25. Some, some cities go up to 32. Uh, 85th percentile speed, ours, our minimum is 30. The 12 city average is 32, so we don't, so we're a little bit more relaxed in that regard. Um, our minimum volume requirement is 1,000 cars per day, and uh, the citywide average is 1,100. So again, we're, we're kind of in line with industry practices. And while some cities may appear to have relaxed certain uh, 
criteria, they, for example, if city of Santa Ana, there is no minimum uh, volume, so that appears more relaxed, but they compensate for that by making the speed requirement a lot higher. So their 85th percentile speed is actually 35 miles per hour rather than 30. So when you, av when you balance it all out and look at the criteria in its totality, um, our criteria are, are, are pretty much in line um, with, with those of other, with other agencies. Um, that said, it doesn't mean we can't recommend changes to our own program. After all, this, this is Glendale and not Anaheim, Burbank, or, 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 or Santa Ana. Uh, but before we talk about some of those recommendations, I just wanted to go over the pros and cons of speed humps. Uh, obviously, pros, they're mostly self-enforcing. Uh, they're f fairly effective in reducing speeds. They're, they're recognized by members of the community um, as, as a formidable tool for doing so. And there's no loss in parking, so we can implement these speed humps without really impacting parking uh, adversely. <clears throat> Some of the cons, there, are, there is a potential for, for diversion. If you install speed humps on a particular residential street, there is a possibility that to avoid those humps, somebody takes a parallel street and you, you shift the traffic. So that's one of the things that we want to be cognizant of. Uh, it does have the potential to impact emergency response and mobility, and it does produce uh, a little bit more, some noise um, uh, adjacent to residents where the hump is placed in front of. With that in mind, um, we, staff is recommending a two-tiered criteria system. Uh, so one that deals with citywide criteria and one that applies only to school and park zones. And <clears throat> the city right criteria, we're recommending very minimal changes to. Again, it, we're, we're very in line with industry, uh, industry practices, and um, we, we, we feel that uh, our, our current guidelines do strike <coughs> that appropriate balance that I was talking about earlier. Now, schools and parks, I, I, I think uh, we all agree that they deserve a little more uh, consideration um, in terms of traffic calming. So we may, we've, we're proposing uh, it's, we're recommending a few more substantive changes in, in those areas. And kind of here's a summary of, of, of the, um, uh, the proposed changes. So on the left side of the table is, are the four criteria that, that we're looking at, that we're considering. Um, on the second column is our current requirement, and then the third and fourth columns are our proposed requirements for citywide and for school and park zones respectively. Um, so for a community consensus, uh, right now, the current requirement is 75%. That's how many people have to sign the petition in order for us uh, to recommend installation. Uh, <clears throat> for, for, for in the citywide case, we're not recommending any changes. We'll keep it at 75%. In the case of schools and parks, uh, we propose to reduce that requirement from 75 to 67%. Uh, for, for speed, um, the current requirement uh, is 85th percentile speed of 30 miles per hour. Uh, we don't recommend any changes. In, in, for the citywide application for schools and park zones, we're recommending changing that uh, to a 90th, 90th percentile speed of 30 miles per hour. And I'll talk about some of those uh, differences uh, a little bit later. Uh, the volume requirement currently is 1,000 vehicles daily. Uh, again, no changes proposed to the citywide condition. Uh, we're proposing to reduce that to 500 vehicles per day in the vicinity of schools and parks. And the last criterion that we're, we're looking to, to, to modify would, would apply citywide, not just in schools and uh, school and park zones. Uh, right now, the current requirement is uh, no more than one lane in each direction. So that uh, two, basically two-way streets that are two lanes would qualify, but it doesn't necessarily speak to one-way streets. So we're going to add a provision that will allow humps to be installed on, on one-way streets that may have two lanes or one-way streets that may have one lane. Um, both citywide and in school and park zones, provided that they meet all of the other applicable criteria. Again, th this is just a summary of the school and park zone changes. Um, I, I would like to focus on uh, the fourth bullet point, which is modifying the speed requirement from 85th percentile of 30 miles an hour to 90th percentile. It, it appears to be a very small and insignificant change, but sometimes small things can matter, and I think this is an example of exactly that case. So this is actually a uh, real life speed distribution. Um, if, you, uh, if you collect data, traffic data, and you plot it, um, you know, all your observations, uh, your speed distribution will look like a bell curve. Um, and, and that's exactly what we see here. This is actually Virginia Avenue between Glenwood Road and South Street. It was a subject of discussion a few traffic commission meetings ago. So I thought it would be a nice illustration for us. 
Um, and in a bell curve, your, your, your median speed is, is, is where the bar is the highest. It's, it's kind of like the 50th percentile. In this particular case, it kind of correlates to a 23 mile per hour speed. So half of the observations are going slower, half the observations are going faster. And as you move toward the right of the chart, your percentile speed kind of increases. So uh, for example, when we go to 27 miles per hour, that represents the 75th percentile speed. 29 miles per hour, that represents the 85th percentile speed. 31 miles an hour, that's the 90th percentile speed. The bottom line is that the 90th percentile speed is always gonna be higher than the 85th percentile speed. So if we require the 90th to be 30 rather than the 85th, you're, <clears throat> you're increasing the probability that a, that a street will qualify for speed humps. And if you look at it differently, um, again, the 85th percentile speed requires 15% of the cars be traveling above that threshold, the 90th percentile speed, you're down to only 10% crossing that threshold. And it, it, it is um, a, a, a pretty su substantial change. Um, and because these changes were substantial, we did discuss, have preliminary discussions, preliminary discussions, excuse me, with some of our uh, community stakeholders, including the Glendale Unified School District, Glendale Police Department, Glendale Fire Department. Uh, they've all uh, issued emails to our office concurring with our proposal and, and expressing support for it. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the number of qualifying streets will increase, uh, so there, we, we would need potentially a, additional funding to implement the program uh, if it is approved. And last, just to summarize uh, staff's recommendation, uh, we, we recommend that the commission, uh, recommend that the council approve um, that on citywide, that, that citywide uh, will allow speed humps on one-way streets that satisfy all the other criteria and in school zones um, allow speed humps on one-way streets that sat and also revise the criteria for speed, volume, and petition rate as uh, previously discussed in this presentation and as before you in your, in your staff report. And again, all other criteria will remain unchanged and must be met. And that concludes my presentation. With that, I'd uh, be happy to answer any uh, questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? I just have a couple, but I may have some more later also. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tate, for the summary of your proposed and recommended uh, changes. The last visual you put up, please, just for clarification. <clears throat> this one? No, I'm the last one, the one just before Q&A, that one. Um, is this saying then that uh, the strategies within these areas can be from humps to everything else you listed, not just humps? Is that correct? Yes. Yes. It, all the, the, the strategies that you mentioned earlier that can be used for traffic calming. Yeah, traffic calming eligibility, including okay. including and up to speed humps. Okay, including and up to. And does this also mean that right now it is allowed on two-way streets? Right now there, yeah. It, 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 there it, are it, some existing, but I mean, if someone were to come to the city on a two-way street, it would it would be allowed. You're just adding this. Yes. To it. Yeah. We're not okay. we're not we're not removing the, the ability. To, okay. uh, obviously, the majority of our streets are two way. We're just adding additional provisions to allow for their installation on one way streets because okay. that provision isn't currently in our guidelines. And on that second bullet, is that school and park zones or just uh, school? I, I do apologize, Mr. Commissioner. You're absolutely right. It okay. is schools and parks. Okay. And as an example, just for a kind of a layperson here, please, at Verdugo Park, and you have Kenyatta. And I know Kenyatta has its other attributes and other challenges. If that were to have a strategy for calming, is it just where the park starts and ends, or does it consider the kind of traffic that can happen a block or two north and a block or two south of a park it, or a school? It, it would really be uh, on, on the block that, that, that abuts the park. Only there. O only there, and, and it could extend a little bit beyond depending on where the block starts or ends. And depending on the strategy, I guess. C cor correct. Mm -hmm. But obviously, uh, you know, it, it's, we, we want to be careful, uh, you know, not to, not to facilitate that proliferation of, the, of these devices. And if we expand the program uh, too far outward, uh, I, I, I think you may get, uh, you know, a, a lot of those humps that start interfering with emergency response and, and mobility. But still, there would be a strategy that if enough, let's just say like on 
on Verdugo Park, across the street to the east, there it's another park in a way. So there are no residents here. How does 75, how do you get to the threshold to bring that to the table if someone is concerned about the pedestrians that are on both sides? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's Kenyatta Boulevard and there's a park on both sides. There's probably no one, no residences on those two sides. Right. How, how would that be addressed? And what, does it, what does it take to put that on the table, I guess? Right. So we're talking about Kenyatta and, and, and Verdugo, Kenyatta Boulevard and Verdugo Road specifically? Just Kenyatta Boulevard. Yeah, and, and, and really where, Kenyatta, the, where there's park on both sides. Right. And, and remember what I said, that all the other criteria had to be met. Uh, unfortunately, in the case of Kenyatta and Verdugo, uh, they're both arterial streets. They're both primary emergency response routes. So, and, and they're not in residential districts. So they, 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 would, it, they, would, be, they would not be part of this, the, the traffic calming program. There are other things that we can look at on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, and, and we have. We, we've implemented in, uh, flashing beacons, in roadway warning lights, uh, th things that, uh, that we feel sl slow traffic down on, on these arterial facilities. But in terms of being made a part of this program, uh, arterial streets wouldn't, wouldn't qualify. Well, I think earlier you called them local or residential. This uh, Kenyatta there would be a local. Is that correct? Uh, no, Kenyatta, parts of Kenyatta may be residential, but they're non-local. There, it's an arterial. It's, a, it's an arterial street. It's a major arterial uh, within the city. Well, the danger on that Verdugo Park with kids running yeah. out of the streets there and everything is is very serious. I don't know if they've had many accidents, but I've seen potential accidents there on Cunada, people driving north and south at speeds beyond the speed limit. I think is 35. Yes, you're you're correct. Yeah. Okay, I. Um, and again, because the speed limit is 35, it, it would not necessarily, it wouldn't be prudent to install a vertical deflection device on, on a speed, uh, mm -hmm. a, a facility with that high of a prevailing speed, basically. Mm -hmm. I, I may have some other questions later. Sure, Thank you very sure. much. Now, uh, this primarily going to apply for school zones and parks. Now, school zones, they, they're busy during rush hour in the morning and the afternoon, and primarily five days a week. And parks probably over the weekend where a lot of them probably out of town traffic, not let's say for lack of words, organic traffic right, that's within the area, that oftentimes busy. Um, are the parks really getting, or do we have any complaints from the parks? Has police cited anything that, uh, any problem that parks are creating over the weekend? Um, I, I had invited the, I, I wish the police department were here to speak to citations and volumes of citations. I, I don't have, uh, you know, the, 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 those, types of those types of details. I, I, I can say that um, uh, having worked here for a few months and having worked here also years ago, this is actually my second stint with the city, uh, we, we, we did get um, a reasonable volume of complaints um, in, in term, uh, expressing concern f over speeding around schools and parks. Reason or my question is, I hate to sort of put a burden on the rest of the population that's use it most of the time uh, just to solve a problem for a few hours a week or a handful of hours during a week by putting uh, speed bumps and so on. Um, going back to Commissioner Gonzalez's concern is very valid. Glendale College and Kenyatta, it's busy during the week and during the weekend. Weekends, that place is very busy, especially during summer months. And people have just, they don't use the crosswalks and just run across. That is dangerous, and plus there's a lot of people who drive at, at exceeding speeds. Do we have a plan for that, knowing the fact that it's an arterial street? The same, same thing is true, for example, Grand Park. I mean, Grandview, people go up all the way. People go over there to take photos for wedding pictures. They could show up there with limousines. And oftentimes they speed on Grandview. Is Grandview considered arterial street? Um, I, I, obviously, the, the streets around Glendale College are arterial streets, and, and, and for those streets, uh, again, speed radar feedback signs are appropriate forms of traffic calming for all streets, whether they're local or arterial. And we do, as I mentioned before, uh, have a fleet of, of radar uh, signs that we that we display. That's one tool that we have. 
uh, I think enforcement in this particular case, enforcement would, you know, people are jaywalking or, 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 or running red lights. Really, you, there's engineering there, there has limitations, you know, in terms of how much it can accomplish and how much it can do to combat these sorts of activities. Uh, in these cases, enforcement is, 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 is an equally valuable tool. I agree. But we the, the speed radar signs are, are a traffic calming feature that we can mobilize anywhere throughout the city. Because as we go into next week, I'm reading there's going to be more traffic, more people in the city, and we'll equ have equal obligation to move the traffic as well to the middle of the other city. And uh, by having inc increasing number of speed bumps, we're going to slow traffic, and it, I mean, eventually the traffic's not going to move. I'm afraid because in South Glendale, we had several people, similar, several streets come to us during the last several years asking for speed bumps, and I'm sure more of them is going to come down the stretch. And um, doing this round of school is very essential because during school hours, those five days in the morning, afternoon, they're, they're having increasing traffic. And it was three or four weeks ago after our, uh, I observed, I woke up early in the morning and I drove on Glen Oaks. Folks coming down after our Virginia meeting, actually, coming down Highland and Concord, most of them are going down Concord, getting on a freeway to go, get, get, uh, to go to work. I'm assuming a lot of them, a lot of those folks that are in those 15, 20 minutes are people who you dropped off their children in the morning at either, there are three schools there, thousands of kids go to school there. Now, uh, we want to protect the kids, of course, uh, and we want to do the right thing. If we have increasing amount of, uh, number of bumps over there at humps, uh, how much are we slowing down the traffic and how far out from the school are we going to go? One street out or two or three streets out from the school area? Um, the, the special provisions just apply to uh, a streets that front the school. If the streets around the school meet the, the general criteria, they would be eligible for, for speed humps. But again, uh, we have to have a request. We have to do the initial screening. We have to do the engineering evaluation. And it has to meet all of the, the criteria uh, that are set forth in the, in, in the program. So um, there's a lot of things that have to occur before a, a hump is even is even installed. Uh, for example, uh, let's take another example, Glendale High School. Broadway is a major arter arterial street, so is Verdugo. There's a lot of traffic there, a lot of, a lot of kids drive to school over there too. Um, uh, if there's a consensus there, are we putting bumps on Broadway and, and, and Verdugo? Would that, would that qualify? Again, Broadway and Verdugo are arterials. They are, uh, by definition, uh, on the city's primary emergency response system. So uh, they, they would be ineligible for, for speed bumps. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking out loud. Wilson is next to the freeway. People get drive through there on Monterey to get to the freeway. And that's mostly residential. And that may qualify for speed bumps. It, 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 it wouldn't um, because it's non-local. Remember the different the distinction that yes. we have to between uh, uh, local and residential. So Broadway, parts of Wilson, they are residential, but they're non-local. In fact, I think both are designated as arterial streets in our circulation element of the general plan. And they are heavily used by, by fire, by, uh, by transit services, by, uh, and some may even be on goods movements routes. So we, though speed humps are really inappropriate for, for those types of principal facilities. And, and they wouldn't be eligible under our, under our existing or proposed guidelines. Thank you. One question. You said that they can't be considered on transit routes. Does that mean that transit routes should not also be on residential streets? Because Kennet is residential, right? Yes. Okay. So Kennet, we've many times considered, you know, having transit lines on Kennet. So does that apply uh, is, is the other way? So the, the, the fact that it's a transit route would preclude a street from, 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 from speed humps. Um, but the fact that it's residential, and, and I, I'd have to speak, I, 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 I don't want to speak for the transit manager, um, but I, I believe there are certain streets um, that are in residential areas uh, that are along transit routes. Um, so Stalker, I think parts of Stalker, yes. uh, Kenneth, um, and, and as you go toward the south end of the city, um, I think obviously Broadway, Wilson, all of those. So I'm not understanding the logic behind that because 
explain it to me. Why? Why would, would, if it's a transit route, we would not consider any traffic calming devices if it's residential? The, um, one, one, of the, one of the reasons that, that, that's, that's come to my attention is a lot of times on buses, um, you know, you have people standing and you have uh, people holding on to uh, bars or, or what, what have you. Uh, and, and so the, the, the humps could potentially be problematic for people who are, who are standing or, and, and not seating in, in, in a stable position. Well, the bus should be going prima facie a speed limit of 25 miles per hour, right? You would Just, hope, yeah, yes. We would, you, we would hope that. Now, if there's, a, 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 and really, the, 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 the transit requirement was established by council in, in 96 and also or adopted by council in 96 and also uh, was left alone in the, in the understood, 2004 update. Understood, so. but we're proposing changes to it. Sure, and, and okay. And, and, and I need a good reason to buy it. Okay. And, and uh, it's only fair, uh, a residential street, it's a residential street. Uh, uh, if, 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 if they have a speeding issue, just because a bus rides on that route, that doesn't mean that we should not address their concerns. And that concerns me. It's, it's something that we can certainly uh, go back and, and, and reassess and potentially, at, if, if, if at the Commission's direction, uh, make it a part of sure. uh, the revisions. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to be clear about how, what you're saying by a bike. So it's, a, a, let's make it very simple. If it's a square property of a school, yeah. we're talking about the, the streets that run parallel to the sides of the school. We're not talking about a, a street that's that's coming perpendicular to a school? Uh, the streets along the perimeter. The perimeter. perimeter. Yeah. Okay. There, in your discussion of this and staff's uh, research, did I'm sure at some point you you probably have a sense of how many streets this problem, because as we're talking here, uh, it's being eliminated left and right for, you know, uh, emergency response or, um, and some that I'm thinking off the top of my head, it's eliminated because of the eight degree uh, uh, grading issue. Um, do you have a sense of, of how many streets uh, this we're talking about in terms of being affected by this, in terms of opening up the, the floodgate, how much? You know, that, that's, we, we don't have the complete r r research on that. Uh, w one of the things that, that we did take a look at was over the last, uh, looking at the requests that came into our office over the last uh, two years, mm -hmm. uh, how many of those, and I think there was a list of 60 or 70 requests, how many of those requests would be affected by this particular proposal? And I think it was something on the order of six or seven streets. So it was about 10% of the, the requests that, that we received uh, in the last two years. Okay, so I guess the question I have uh, in discussing, I. I, I, do, I do understand and appreciate the emphasis and focus on the schools and the parks coming from the uh, pedestrian safety and the idea of encouraging people to walk. Um, I'm liking the idea that we're putting our money where our mouths are and trying to tweak things to make things um, more pleasurable, enjoyable, safer for people around those typically walkable areas um, to feel. The, um, question I have is, what, the thing that kind of rattled me, of course, is um, this will open the floodgates. And I know Commissioner Sahakian and I um, have been here long enough to know um, that's, you know, it's one of my main, because I can't speak for him, but what's one of my main concerns is uh, approval of these uh, speed humps is, you know, opening, again, this, this uh, a domino effect uh, across the city. Um, with that being said, if we're focused on the school zone area, uh, the idea of, uh, you had mentioned it, it's going to cost money. It's going to, we're going to have to start looking into other resources. And I'm curious to know, did you look into the idea of piggybacking these improvements on grants of safe routes to school, since it is, it is within the school zone? Would that be something that would qualify uh, so that the city doesn't necessarily have to flip the bill in a, in a budget or... Uh, we, we can certainly look into uh, whether or not Safe Routes to School would fund humps. Uh, I, 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 I think... If they're doing crosswalks, I mean, I'm just, yeah. if they're, if just thinking out loud, if they're, if they're doing crosswalks, if they're doing, uh, you know, ability for, you know, uh, safe passage, um, you know, that kind of tangentially plays in that whole uh, storyline 
of being able to make things safer. So I don't know. That's more for the the. the yeah, I was looking at Fred. And, right, and right. Fred's he's, he's not, not there. Here. Right. I'm looking well, for Fred. What, so. I, what I can say is speed humps. <laughs> speed humps. While they're recognized uh, tr roadway features, they're not official traffic control devices, and because of that. Uh, I'd have to do a little bit more research to see okay. if they can be. Um, okay, I, I would appreciate that because I'd love to see ways that we can um, not necessarily burden uh, the city on things that we can maybe get some grants for. The other a quick thing and comment I want to make is, boy, we don't seem to have a problem when it comes to you know the perfect scenario of getting these humps in. I. I just really feel for people, I, I'm not in that situation, but I feel for people who live on these emergency response routes because it's a, it's a catch-22. Yes, you have the emergency response so that the fire trucks can traverse the streets easily, but guess what? That means every other uh, person who doesn't want to abide by the law can also take those streets. Over. And I think I'm off the cuff, I'm thinking of Opeachy, for example. I mean, I don't live there or near there, but that's, that's one of the streets that comes to my mind. It's a, it's a uh, you know, Disneyland ride for people coming down uh, that road, and you can't do anything, and the, the people are um, exacerbated because there's only so much the rolling speed signs will do. I don't know, I think it's an issue, uh, maybe not at this point in time, at some point very soon, it needs to be discussed that maybe perhaps um, those streets that are designated as these arterial routes somehow get a prioritization um, when it comes to cities, I'm gonna say resources, but you know, if we're gonna send the police out to, to ticket, you know, let that be um, a place for them to focus their attention because I really do feel for them, they have no, I mean, uh, People come here all the time, want speed humps, I want speed humps, but you know, for people who really truly are facing speeders, I mean, we're not talking 30 to 32 miles an hour, we're talking people speeding, they can't even consider, they can't even gather petitions to do something to effectively change the safety of their neighborhood. So just something, I'm planting the seed, Larry, I just throw that in there. Um, something to consider, maybe we can um, start looking at that because it's, it's long overdue, I think, for, for people who live in those streets, and there's plenty of them around the city. If, if I may, uh, please piggyback on those comments, because and maybe it's this is the time to, depending on what other commissioners think, because we have a, a, an opportunity to not only make a recommendation, uh, eventually this is gonna go to city council, that maybe uh, part and parcel of recommending or approving this, that we look at other areas uh, for example, it was been based by uh, commented on by other commissioners. When we first saw the presentation, which was really well done, thank you very much, was it was a local street or a residential street was the adjective. And then later we heard about arterial streets. And then also there was systematic speeding versus random speeding. I think what I'm hearing is in living in the city and living on a, what I think is considered has been stated many times on arterial street as Kenyatta. It's also must be, has to be a systematic speeding one because they're always speeding on Kenyatta. The thing that mitigates it a lot are the radar signs. You, I can tell when I drive it and when I see other people in the radar sites. I guess my question, uh, Mr. Tay, is what are the ways other than humps that these speed conditions, and you mentioned Opeachy and other ones that are perpendicular to Kenyatta, they're coming down very, very fast. Um, what are the, what, what are, the, you listed a few, but are there, are there, other than the radar science, because I'd like to ask a couple of questions about that in a minute, what are the mechanisms that can be addressed to reduce systematic speeding on arterial streets? And I know it's not humps, but there's got to be, you mentioned a few other items up there. Um, there was like curb lines, right. and there was a few striping and things like that. Is this an opportunity to communicate to the city council through this, this presentation that you're doing today to have a study of some kind of what can we do to remove or to mitigate systematic speeding? And, and on Kenyatta particularly and other arterial streets where there are parks and schools. It's really serious on Kenyatta going downhill from north to south in front of Verdugo Park, not to mention the residential areas north of that. 
Now, now you had mentioned Opeechee, sir. Uh, that I mentioned it because uh, our chair mentioned it. And I, I mentioned it. <laughs> okay. And I was reminded about Opeechee. I just happened to live a block away from Opeechee, and I walk that neighborhood, and those cars come down really yeah. fast. Yeah. So I don't, I don't believe our, I don't believe Opeechee is an, ar an arterial street. It, it may fall on a primary re emergency response route, but I don't believe it's an, it's an arterial. Is it a local it is, or a residential? A primary response. It is. I believe so. Okay. Okay. Uh, but it, it, in that particular case, it, it, as you said, it could be pavement markings. Uh, edge lines are, mm -hmm. are, are a nice tool. I think we installed them on Country Club Drive back in 2007. Um, so we, when you've got a combination of center line striping and edge line, mm -hmm. you, you kind of narrow down those lanes. And there's a correlation between travel speeds and, 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 and perceived width of the lane. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, and, and then there's signs that, 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 that we can, that we can um, install uh, to, to just better educate motorists. And, and the signs in the... Markings can be installed on both local and arterial streets. And arterial streets. So is there a way that, uh, in the interest of moving something like this that really has done some good work to, to be able to add some type of language that in states that there would be some further dialogue or studies regarding arterial streets and reducing systematic speeding? I mean, I don't know what the radar signs cost. I think they're not inexpensive, but, but it, th we're talking about saving some very serious accidents. And, and, and the, when the police are there, by the way, it really slows the traffic down. Yeah, Madam Chair, if, if uh, I'll come to your defense here. Uh, speed humps is only one of the tools in the quiver when it comes to traffic calming, and that was stated in one of the slides. You do have road diets, you do have enforcement, you do have the, the changeable message signs. So I know we're concentrating on the speed humps, but mm -hmm. There are other tools, and in some instances, like it could be OPG or some of the other streets, uh, there could be the need for, for a study, specific study yes, that yeah. could uh, uh, result in, in out-of-the-box ideas on how to mitigate that. Right, right. But some of these streets, short of uh, enforcement, 100% uh, enforcement, unless you narrow the street down to bring the traffic to I don't want to say a halt to a very slow speed, right? It's very difficult to, to uh, 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 resolve the problem. But then again, when you do that on arterial streets, an arterial street by definition, how many vehicles per, per day? What's the ADT on the arterial, arterials? It ranges between 20,000 and 40,000. So, so when you take a 20,000 to 40,000 volume and you narrow it down, then you are creating traffic backup. So, so and I, re I respect that, and yeah. I understand it, but there's also a freeway that's parallel, that it, the two freeway that's parallel is where people should be going at the speeds they're, they're developing on Kenyatta. Right, no, you're absolutely right. right. So you're if we slow right. them on arterial where their residence is, then there, they would seem like the, the, the drivers will say, I can't go here, it's too slow, I'm gonna go, gotta get on the freeway. Which is originally, because I remember that the Kenyatta, before there was the freeway, I mean, it was like bumper to bumper. My mother lived there, so it was right. really, really not only dangerous, except the bumper to bumper slowed it down. Right, right. But I wish there was a way that all arterial streets where there is systematic speeding, we could figure out a way, in, in, you know, in addition to the radar signs and things. I don't know what it would cost, maybe it's prohibitive, but systematic speeding is significant. I mean, it, it and especially on part where there's a park. Well, uh, to go along with that, I, I mean, I would s probably suggest that, um, well, it seems that if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the commission seems to be uh, in, a, in agreement uh, with the recommendation of city staff. But um, if we somehow uh, tack onto that, um, that additional, you know, it's the recommendation of this commission to have a, a future study on ways to uh, understand and address this the systematic uh, speeding on these, not just the arterials, but, you know, these emergency response um, uh, streets. It affects a lot of Glendale, I mean, a lot of residents, and it's the number one issue that concerns uh, you know, that's number one reason the residents give why they don't walk in the city of Glendale. I know this because I went on the 
on the walkabout is, is the, the speed. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's all interrelated. It's all interrelated with pedestrian plans, uh, safety, education. But I think that this would be something sending a message to the city uh, from this commission that, you know, uh, I, I, I personally am in agreement with, uh, with this tweaking of this, but also to uh, let them understand that there's um, concerns that we have, um, you know, beyond, beyond this. That cannot be addressed with the implementation guidelines of speed humps. It leaves a, a vast area of Glendale out. If, Madam Chair, if I may, have we considered uh, photo speed enforcement? It's becoming more common now uh, nationwide. I don't believe the California Vehicle Code currently, as of yet, allows for it in California. I know that other states, such as Arizona, Washington, and uh, the Maryland area, have, have started using photo speed enforcement. Yes. But I believe that the California Vehicle Code still explicitly prohibits its use in California. Well, maybe we should talk to our lobbyists and see, because that is a solution. It is a you solution. Take a four, right. yeah, because right. it, and, and, and not an, as a, as a money-generating uh, venue, but uh, maybe we should start lobbying uh, Sacramento to, to do that. Well, we have it. Am I correct, uh, Mr. Kay? We did have photo. Uh, That's not speed. No, that, that, those were red speed. light. That was photo oh, red light. Oh, right. That is right. And, is, and that was deemed, is that deemed unconstitutional? It was unconstitutional. It's illegal. It was no. Why? Uh -oh. Uh, Madam Chair, yes, that was deemed unconstitutional, and so they have not, they have taken down those red light um, cameras. Uh, the mountain and canal. Yeah, I'm in agreement with, uh, with Commissioner Sahakian on this. I think that's something that we should, to look yeah, I, it's very effective. I agree with them 100%, and I'd like to see, um, see if we can pursue that. I would concur, and it, I, a beautiful place where this works is in Spain. I mean, it, in the highways, it just, it just, it tells you it's there and you slow down, you stop. I mean, you don't stop, you slow down because you're gonna get a photograph and then you get the ticket in the mail. So, yeah, I think, I think uh, if, if, if I'm hearing everyone correctly, I think that's probably the, you know, um, you know maybe we, uh, that would fall under an alternative three if I'm, uh, for, this, for this motion. Well, well, let me, uh, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, uh, as far as schools and, uh, and parks, I think we need to define the distance away from these schools and parks, how far we can put that. Even though you said, but we have to define in a, perhaps in our, in our uh, uh, petitions right now that how far out can we go. For example, if you look at Clark Magnet or Balboa Elementary or Valley View, they're in 100% residential areas. How far out are we gonna go uh, to put these street bumps? Uh, what if people, are traveling to and from to drop their kids off and some other people that they don't want to bother during 15 minutes in the morning or 15 minutes in the afternoon during rush hours. And, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, do we, do we want to uh, punish stress the residents? Because uh, contrary to what Commissioner Yakupian, Chairperson Yakupian said, is a friend of mine lives at the bottom of Green, Greenbrier. He goes, I can't stand the people on top of the hill with their sports car going, cruising up the, up the hill. And do we need bumps? He said, yes, but do I wanna, uh, do I wanna sign up for it? He said, no, because I, I already come to get home going over all these bumps on mountain. So the people on uh, in, the, within the, in the city that they go both ways, and we have to respect their opinion too. I mean, the guy on Greenbrier was very angry that people up the street, they take their sports car and make a lot of noise, especially two, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, traveling at high speeds. The um, mechanism that Commissioner Sahakian suggests very, very well, that late at night, turn on those uh, cameras and they'll, they'll get tickets at whatever, whatever time of the day it is. There's no, if there's police enforcement or not. Uh, but do we wanna uh, subject the rest of law-abiding citizens to these because of the five or 10% of people or because of 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon, five days a week, traffic at, specific, at a given area. Well, I, I guess that, that would be one reason to, to keep the petition rate at 75% citywide. So we wouldn't necessarily install these humps unless there's an overwhelming uh, consensus and, 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 and the residents of the affected block tell us under no uncertain terms that this is in fact what, what they want. Um, so. Uh, 
the, the, the speed humps are an option. It's, a, it's available if the community so it's chooses. Option. Yeah, and it'll remain an option uh, on, on, under our revised guidelines. In terms of defining a, uh, uh, a distance from a school, uh, my, our staff's recommendation is just limiting uh, the revised guidelines to streets that abut or are w around the school perimeter. Um, if the commission would like to consider expanding that, um, that's something that. How can we define that further? Uh, so we have several options here. So there, there's four major um, changes to um, the speed hump qualifications. One is adding one-way streets. The other is redu reducing the community consensus requirement to 67% when it comes to schools and parks. Um, and then the other one is um, the 90th percentile and then the minimum volume requirement. Certainly we don't have to move the, um, on this matter today. We can postpone it if we want um, further discussion as to a, a further definition of what a butt would include um, in the areas for schools and parks. We can certainly move to recommend changes of, you know, one, two, three, or four, um, you know, you can do all four, you can do two out of the four. Um, if you feel that the discussion, the um, recommendation is premature, we can certainly come back um, to consider the matter further. I have a suggestion to consider. Sure. Uh, it, it, it ties in with your suggestion earlier, uh, Madam Chair, and that is that under alternative number three, that we have some language that maybe uh, Ms. Ewing could help us with that says that the, the TPC recommends that the city council um, by resolution make a, the city staff make a more definitive study regarding our arterial systematic speeding and issues of, of proximity, something more, um, so that this doesn't get delayed, it keeps moving, but that it, it I think our, this recommendation is before us, I fully um, comprehend and would concur with it's just that it doesn't go deep enough relative to, to systematic s speeding on streets and on ar arterial areas. So I don't know if there's a way of making language to that effect if the commission would concur so that this would continue and then move on. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez, certainly we can move um, to recommend the changes that have um, already been proposed and then as a separate um, matter, we could bring back the item, staff can bring back the item for further um, study of arterial streets. Here's another question. Do we have a way, a mechanism in place to, again, I think you tipped off, like once this gets out, then we'll have a, I don't know if you said flood, but we'll have definitely a lot more uh, petitions um, and requests that because it's a new change that we limit the number that are reviewed initially so that we can observe how they are done and what, because my fear is as it's passing through and everything's going, oh, you know, they're meeting everything and there's no reason not to, uh, we don't necessarily see the, the bigger picture, but if, if we can in this initial phase uh, approve X amount, uh, so that we can see just how effective it is, and that's going to uh, like a pilot program. Um, you just see, just to, just to see how it is, as opposed to all at once um, having a sudden uh, onslaught of um, a speed hump. So, so the criteria, if I'm understanding you correctly, Madam Chair, the criteria would would would, would apply, but only to a, cer a, a, a specified discrete number of, of requests. Uh, you know, initially, I think. I mean, I, I'm just throwing this out there to my fellow commissioners, if that's a, an idea well, or a concern of yours. L let me understand the plan. If this gets approved, are we going to go and start installing speed humps on every street in the city that qualifies, even without? any residents applying for one? No, no, uh, it, we, we, we would be, it would be a, a, a reactive approach. So when, when, right. when, when there's a request for traffic calming, then we would investigate the re request. We wouldn't preemptively, uh, you know, no. evaluate every single yeah, so, so you don't expect a, a, a sudden surge of demand in these speed humps, am I correct? Um, uh, it, it, requests. I mean, it, it, what, what I would expect is just based on historical requests. I think I think the same number of requests that we've received in the last, 
the, the same rate of request we'll basically continue. will continue. Oh, okay. We'll continue. Then I misunderstood yeah. you. I, I, I took. Yeah, that's okay. what I think too. I, I, I didn't yeah. understand. I didn't. But to go back and address uh, uh, the other issue we discussed, I'm fine with the recommendation as is, but I'd like to include a clause to counsel that these changes do not address speeding problems on arterial highways within the city limits. And to make a recommendation for staff to come back to us uh, with, with uh, uh, other, other approaches uh, uh, to address these issues, including photo speed enforcement, because that is one of the solutions. For the arterial. That's true. Well, other, than, other than that, it's hard really what you're asking the staff. They will go back to the drawing board. Yeah. But this is like a blocking freeway to move it to another freeway or blocking major arterial street to push it somewhere else. This is not as practical, nor, nor what's intended the arterial street to do. So now there's a speed on the arterial. We need to look into other non really physical barrier or choking that lane, that road. Otherwise, we'll be creating problems somewhere else. Okay. It's very difficult to deal with the, with the massive road with that size uh, in order to really slow it down. Like, like you know, uh, Commissioner Sahakian mentioned, uh, the camera is your best option. Now, they still have the red lights camera still installed some in some intersection in San Diego, even by the airport. And some cities, they still use it, but not sure whether it can be used as to catch speeder um, before you approach intersection in a typical snapshot on that. If that's not constitu you know, unconstitutional, this is very hard now to see how you can slow down or encourage people to take freeway or take other street. Um, it's not easy task, just to let you know, I, I, I don't like to. Uh, I appreciate that it's not an easy task. However, I think- Not, not how can it be possible. No, I think it's that's possible that's if we know what our goal is. As mm. mentioned earlier, and as mentioned by Mr. Tay, the key word he had up there was balance. And as mentioned by our chair, this has to do with the pedestrian plan. It has to do with a, a value of what do we feel we should have on our streets. And, and we are going hopefully more and more to making our streets walking streets. While we know we have cars, we know we have to move traffic, it's a balance and, how, and it's safety. So I, I know it's not easy, but it, it's something that I think we should be addressing for the safety of, I can see people saying, well, why would you not, not why are you not slowing traffic down and you have a pedestrian plan? I think it's a balance. Well, uh, to just go on that, I, you know, I just, I'm certainly no expert and I don't claim to be, but I have been uh, involved with so many discussions over the past many years with the engineers of the city to understand uh, what tools are available to the city uh, in these situations. And um, quite often, um, you know, there's the, there's expense, um, there's sometimes doing one thing uh, to do something causes uh, issues somewhere else. But just to kind of move this along and, and start really trying to get our teeth into what we can start doing uh, out of the box thinking, I'm gonna go back to uh, Commissioner Sahakin's suggestion of let's explore this idea of photo, um, photo of our, just off the record, I don't believe the city of Glendale made a lot of money on those photo cameras that you know, took pictures of violations. So people thinking that we're reaping in the cash because of that is not the case. But if the end result is to slow people down, then we're victorious. Um, but I would, I will agree with uh, Commissioner Sahakin's suggestion that we move along with this um, recommendation, alternative one, uh, oh, but with, with that language that um, staff perhaps go and Come research, come back to us. And I don't know if it takes the city council's approval to fund a study for it or how that necessarily works, if you, if you need uh, a more ability to, to look into this, but to then come back to the commission and report to us um, specifically about the arterial and emergency response uh, streets in Glendale. Madam Chairperson, you know, you can maybe have it in two phases, phase one, just to tackle the school and the parks. That's what the intent of those revisions. 
even though we're still looking at citywide traffic calming, but those are specifically targeting those two locations. This will be the phase one of that study if you like to pass it or, or, or get your approval. The second phase is to look at the arterial and major, major collector street, how we do it, how we can find a way to slow down the traffic uh, that can be also allowable. If the camera can, if not allowed in state, but can be allowed on the local through a resolution, some local jurisdiction, that's something you can look into. Okay. There's the other way where we can invest more money into buying, you know, there's the speed uh, where you bring the, your uh, speed warning um, sign where you can, the, the police can provide those on certain street. They used to have camera in those also, used to be allowed, I'm not sure if it's still allowed. That's something you can also be used and it's mobile. We can target certain street as deemed needed. Uh, we'll see what the other out there can be legal, <laughs> can right. be legally used not be challenged in court and wasting everybody's time and money. Right. And, and really it, it did get bad rap back then because the, the company who installed those cameras, uh, they see big, big money, yeah. big revenue. They start tweaking and tampering with the timer and mess up the, the right turn, the left turn, and people in the middle of the intersection, they get, they get speed, they get the uh, uh, red, red light ticket, why still orange. They play a lot of things really, that's one of the main reasons those cameras. Yes, but these cameras will be on the straightaway. They will not be Correct. in the section. In this case, exactly. There's no question <laughs> right. and, and say whether I was halfway intersection or this is really a straight shot yeah. and something the staff we discuss it to put on Virginia actually. And then there will be trailers and then there's no and you, you can right. move them around. So uh, and, and can be challenged because yeah. it's straight shot and we're yeah. not questioning what maneuver you're making or what you mean. We'll, we can look into that, see if that's something can be. So Mr. Hedy, are you suggesting that we don't attach that language onto our, our motion? I, I, would, I would prefer to keep, if you like to, to start the staff be able to implement those, those, those recommendations and take it to the council. Okay. We can do that as a first step. We can touch on it as a next step and we can mention it to the council. This phase will, is completed as, as approved by the commission, but the next step that the commission uh, you know, recommend the staff to do is to look into how we can traffic calming the arterial and the major collector street. Because that's may take some study, more pilot study, and you're gonna do it during, make sure there's no action on the freeway. There's certain timing, weather condition, there's certain time we can do that study without tampering with the data. Whether uh, for some reason, some construction will be doing paving road and we get complaints some other street, there's a traffic we find out because we're diverting traffic. So the study to address the arterial, that's something that's gonna take some time. If, if you wanna combine them all together, that's fine. If you wanna do it in step to show mm -hmm. some progress and, and, and maybe testing those recommendations, whether it's valid or not, it's been working or not, maybe we can separate those studies. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the commission, for purposes of the Brown Act and just sticking to what we have agendized at hand, I would recommend that we would either recommend the four proposed changes, either one through four of them. Um, we can consider further discussion of them or we can move not to recommend them at all and that's the decision that's before you today. And if we would like further discussion regarding um, traffic control measures on arterial streets or emergency response routes, that that certainly can be agendized for a future um, meeting well, by the commission. We're not being that specific and I right. don't understand why the Brown Act comes into the picture here. All we're saying is that we're moving this as is. Okay. But what we're saying, we're attaching language to it that says that this commission does not feel that this, uh, these recommendations are addressing uh, speeding on arterials. And we would like uh, uh, staff to come back to w with, with recommendations that to fix saying. speeding yes. on arterials. That's all we're saying. If, if, if I may if add to that is that we're asking that the city council prioritize it. Yes. Not just that yes. we're asking the city staff. We're asking that the city council, and then it's under alternative number three. I, I also concur in all due respect why we have to consider the Brown Act. It's, it's an alternative. We've been discussing it. It's a public meeting. Right. I, I think it's very clear. I think the step is the right step. And we can recommend to the council also the option not even to approve or adopt that plan. They may tie it to 
what you suggested and do the complete the entire study, right. maybe arterial. Okay. Or they may say, okay, if they get into phase that option, we can provide for the option that you discussed. Okay. Yeah, but again, so there's we, no we need. Miss that. We like this. What was presented yeah, this by is staff, good. this is good. We want to move this forward. We don't want to stop this. Or well, we're saying that in addition to this, we have a concern that spitting on arterials needs to be addressed because this study doesn't address that. And that should trigger council to direct basically staff to, to, to look into it. That's all we're saying here. I'm looking to what kind of funding is that needed. Of everything's of tied to funding. Yeah. Yeah. Everything exactly. is tied to funding. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So, Thank you. Uh, Good job. Fellow commissioners, I think we're going to, um, we will, we will, do I hear someone to make a motion for, I suppose it was alternative one, um, recommending that the city council adopt the recommended changes to the NTCP uh, and have that go through with a message to the city council. <laughs> attached after that uh, as Commissioner Sahakin uh, eloquently uh, laid forward to have them, number one, understand the importance uh, to this commission of examining the arterial roads and emergency response roads in the city of Glendale in regard to the speeding and how that can be addressed and encourage them to uh, use their tools and authority to direct staff into researching that and then we would love to see a result or if that should if that should move through them uh, some sort of response back to this commission on this issue I so move do I hear a second second great next item item six is Commission staff comments and updates Do you have any staff updates? I, I think Start with you, Ed. Fred, I think, already gave that presentation regarding this citywide site pedestrian plan. It's just a friendly reminder for the uh, next Wednesday meeting on uh, March 7, the joint meeting with the Planning Commission to discuss uh, the two items, really, the South Glendale Clinky Plan and the draft EIR. And that's something, um, it will be set up more instruction information on how it will be set up my understanding the planning commission will take the lead on that will take the call uh, roll call for you being there and participate in the meeting and uh, that the rest will be um, kind of managed or, or, or taking the lead on how to run that meeting so we'll get you more information uh, when you're not ready. Any, any, any commissioner comments? Um, I would like to make two. Uh, one, Mr. Hitty, I'd like to see if the city can discuss with Caltrans the possibility of extending the guardrail on the two south where the newly installed carpool lane uh, merges onto the freeway, two south freeway, the on-ramp. Because of the new lane designations on that on-ramp, I foresee a terrible possible accident resulting in the left, left lane and vehicles traveling in that left to suddenly veer left. And unfortunately, it would just be a careening off that on-ramp onto the freeway below. I mean, from where, if you, if you don't Mountain. Know. From Mountain. I'm sorry, yeah. On Mountain Street, on the 2 South on-ramp. Heading, heading, heading yeah. south. Okay. Yeah, because what's happening is those vehicles lined up for the uh, signal. Those that only have one passenger Correct. in that one, one person in the vehicle, uh, in order to escape <laughs> being in that line for that light, will turn suddenly into the carpool lane, which would then result in that vehicle having to swerve to the left. That would be the only alternative for that vehicle. And unfortunately, there's no room on that uh, side to, to go other than down a cliff. So if you're going to use a mountain and you take the on-ramp 
south yes, onto east on mountain. the Karpur Lane. What you're saying, there's no guardrail there? There is, there is, but it needs to be extended. It doesn't go, it doesn't go uh, beyond. So I, I know if we can d discuss with them the possibility of extending that. The other thing that I wanted to bring up is a, is a big thing, uh, but I'm going to get it out there. And I know uh, Ms. Yoon may have heard it buzzing around in the city attorney's office. Um, I would love, this is getting into something that's really um, a peeve of mine, uh, is, start, is starting to re visit our city streets and, and for the city of Glendale to start having a different value on what it is to park on our city streets. And I bring this up because I see commercial vehicles parking on our city streets for no intention other than to advertise. This is not a First Amendment issue. I'm bringing this up because the city of Glendale has a strong public policy and concern to reduce traffic congestion and to free up our parking spaces for those residents who are trying to find a parking space. I believe that it's time for the city to look specifically on what the possibility, right now I think as, as it stands, if, if, a, if a car is parked for 72 hours, only at that point will the, will the police go out there to uh, issue a citation or, or perhaps have it towed as an abandoned vehicle. What's happening now um, are very clever commercial businesses that will park vehicles. I mean, they can park it on, on overpasses. I mean, they're basically a billboard using our city streets, our beautiful, highly valued parking spaces to make money off of us. And we're allowing it. And I just am getting angry about that because I'm beginning to see that we need to start uh, valuing these things uh, in differently. Again, not a First Amendment issue. I'm not going to call out any specific uh, business. <coughs> this is an idea of valuing or that. I know the city, New York City, uh, had a case on this, case law, which I sent off to the city attorney's office to examine. Appeals court ruled in the city of New York's favor to be able to put restrictions on commercial vehicles that are parked for the sole purpose of advertising. advertising. Yeah. So it's something to look into. Um, this is something that I was trying to spearhead and try to get uh, people to understand. Um, what, the, what people might be getting stuck in, in the city, and I don't want to put the city attorney's office, but it's not a First Amendment issue, and not in the least, because of the, un, because of the uh, overwhelming public policy that the city of Glendale has. We go through all the trouble of putting together a pedestrian plan, a safety plan, reduce congestion, uh, make it possible for people to, to park safely, and yet we're afraid to touch uh, this particular issue, and then, so I would like to see staff Again, I, I'm not the first, I've already shouted it on the mountaintop, have this examined to see what the city can do to start making money on, on people that are just using our streets for the sole purpose of advertising. Well, thanks for bringing that, Madam Chair. And having said that, both locals and our, our out-of-towners are doing the same thing. They're out-of-town cars that are, or trucks, in the city or local businesses putting their trucks and vans or banners on their cars in front of their own stores and taking a public parking space to advertise their own businesses too. It's happened both ways, locals and other towners. I mean, it may involve idea of restricting um, the time because, I mean, parking I understand street. there's people who, you know, have to do their work, they park in front of their business, that's understandable, but there must be a way to differentiate uh, someone who's parked there for three days um, as opposed to someone who is using his vehicle. And if maybe it could be a, a time uh, restriction so that it really discourages people from parking their car for the sole purpose of advertising. And it would not harm that legitimate, uh, you know, business that needs the vehicle to go and, you know, fix the plumbing and all the different sorts of things they do in our city. So that's um, something I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, I'm hoping um, to be able to speak with the city attorney's office as I know that they've looked into this issue. But I would love to see if whatever you get from this discussion, that somehow it comes back to the TPC because it directly involves our commission in understanding uh, how this parking uh, could work.
I'll share the city attorney office with some ideas that I was involved in it in other cities to deal with the 72 hours, even though this is allowed by state law, there's a way where you can restrict the days and the time, and you have to move the car after 72 hours somewhere else, 500 feet to 1,000 feet, then they can come back to the same spot, rather than you move the car one inch and you gain another three but days. But 500 feet there is are ways, advertising. But there are ways. We're looking yeah, and I think that's the thing. There, I mean, we have so many bright people problems. in the city of Glendale. There's a lot of I just know that this is people something go that around the tackled. system. Um, I'm, I, hear you, I hear you. I support that, by the way, Madam oh, Chair. Uh, one thing you reminded me about the mountain and the two freeway. Um, I don't know how many years it's been now, but it's been a number of years. If you could please check with Rob, uh, Rubek. He had made contact with uh, Caltrans right. on the that same intersection that our chair is speaking about. <clears throat> People having to um, wait to make a right-hand turn and go south on that ramp that she's talking about is, is going to cause a, a significant accident or two if it hasn't already because there's no one coming from the west and so people get frustrated and they start moving and they could get ticketed but they're not ticketed there's something about the way that intersection is set up that doesn't allow the traffic to flow onto the freeway at mountain and uh south and south mountain yeah, all right it's, well, if i may madam chair i, I do have a couple of more pastor you would understand you're a signal timing guy that that whole uh, signal timing is screwed up between the on and off ramps. The offset, if you take a look at it, it traps you. It traps you between the two intersections. Now I know that we've for four or five yes. years we've gone to Caltrans to 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 begging them to to adjust that, but nothing happens. But you do have uh, uh, cycles where vehicles are waiting with no. Uh, demand from the other directions and nothing happens. Also, if you're going northbound, you get the green light and it's probably 300 feet or so, I would say by the time you get to get the protected only for northbound to northbound only, it turns red, especially in the AM peak hours. So it's, it's th that whole thing needs to be looked at and maybe we can design the signal timing plan and give it to them. Maybe it's a matter of doing that, I'm not sure. Uh, I do have two other items, uh, street signs. Uh, about two years ago, this was a topic for discussion. Some of the signs are faded, you can't read them. And we were told that we are replacing those signs. And two years later, I know that there are no rules regulations with the six inch lettering, I believe. It's a challenge, but uh, we need to do something because you can't read, there's no signs. If, if you don't know the neighborhood, it, it's confusing. If I may. Um, Commissioner Sah Sah Saharian, I can give you some update on that. Sure. Um, by June, we'll be finishing phase two of mm. the the overhead. You refer to the overhead, the street yes. name sign, the eliminated yes. ones. Um, and there's a budget. Uh, we're asking uh, the city to consider uh, a few hundred thousand to do outside the downtown. The focus last couple of years, including this project, more into the downtown area, business area but we're going above and beyond that to citywide replacing all those signs. Yeah, I so hope we're this not is, using this the is same in time. place. Um, it's a new, like you mentioned, the, the rules change in the size and what type of background color is allowed and the new ones will be uh, the LEDs and um, but we'll be doing it citywide, not just downtown. So we, we, you will see, hopefully we'll get that money for the next fiscal year. Uh, but now we're doing it automatically with any street resurfacing would, there's two projects with the city surfacing we do address that and the standalone project where we just target street name signs the overhead street names, the, the eliminated ones uh, downtown wide not city wide yet but next year we're going to see uh, going beyond that area okay. and the last item I have uh, eastbound Glen Oaks approaching Verdugo I know we went to double left protected and then right in front of the church, we have uh, uh, one through lane right now. The taper ratio from the double yellow to the four inch barrier line, it doesn't seem to be a 15 to one ratio. It's, it's very, it, it immediately merges you to the right. 
So I know it's a challenge because you have the bridge and you have, you know, the bridge is only probably 24 feet wide, I'm going to say. But we might want to pull that, you know, uh, west of the bridge so we get a smoother transition. Because if, if you <coughs> go on a certain speed, unless it, it, it feels like it's an abrupt, you know, merge to the right to go straight. Chair, uh, members of the commission, Commissioner Hawking, we, we can certainly take a look at the uh, detailed design of that uh, that taper and that configuration and report Please. back. Thank you. All right. I think we. Uh, any other comments? Just the logistic one. Me meeting next week is at five, not at six. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Six. All right then. Uh, next item. Item seven is adjournment. Do I hear a motion? Motion to adjourn.